don't know if you've noticed this tendency on the internet, and you see it in magazines as well. In fact, it probably came from magazines. This thing of trying to reduce life down into 10 tips or 5 tips or the, you know, the top 10 things to do. Uh, re sort of reduce life down to this really simplistic, um, you know, there's 10 something or others. That's gonna that that'll answer everything. Ten tips to to manage your household budget. Uh, ten top tips for a better sex life. Uh, ten top tips to lose weight. Or the top five things that um, successful people do, and so on and so forth. And you see it a lot with um, particularly love and relationships. Very popular. Very, you know, top ten tips for a successful relationship. And the the thing about relationships uh, and relationships and love and relationships that um, I don't really get is that um, relationships are often referred to as this um, like um, blanket term, like we're all having relationships, um, like we're all having spaghetti, like. The spaghetti is the same, it's just, you know, how you make it, or how you eat it. Uh, relationships, they're all the same, basically, it's just, you know, how you go about it. Which hasn't been my experience at all. Uh, because in as much as um, all my relationships with men are different, all my relationships are with women are different. In fact, I think all my relationships with each person is slightly different depending on the person. So number one, I think talking about relationships, like loving relationships, that doesn't fit for me at all. Then number two, um, women telling me how to have relationships with uh, other women doesn't make sense to me because uh, it'd be like me sort of advising women how to, you know, have a successful relationship. Which is nuts for me, because it's like, uh, well, I'm not a woman, so how would I, I don't know what it's like. I don't know what it's like to be a woman. I don't, I don't understand the mystery. Women are a mystery to me, um, because they're, uh, even though we're humans, uh, you know, they have the same uh, body. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know what it's like to be a woman, so how could I tell a woman how to have a relationship, you know, have a successful relationship with the man? I mean, a woman could ask me what it's like for men, but then, see, I don't really know about men either, all I know about is me. And I think if everyone is honest, that's all they can really say. So sort of being an expert about relationships and love, I don't really get that, I don't really get how you can be. I don't, I, but, but I think it's like, you know, it's, it's like being an expert on snow crystals, you know, like, you know the way each one is different? Like, how can you, how can you be an expert on relationships when every relationship is different? What I am an expert on is me, uh, and how I have in the past fucked up my relationships. <laughs> I have two doctorates and a, and a master's on that. Uh, I'm very expert on that, and I think that's all you can be. Uh, that's all you um, you can do is become an expert on your own issues and how they influence you in a loving relationship. Uh, because in my observation of people. It's your own issues are the things that screw you up. And you can say, well, you know, sometimes you can, you can, you know, get into a relationship with somebody who uh, is just not the right person for you. True. <laughs> Done that. But you, you pick the person. You pick that person because of your issues. You, like everyone else was looking at that person uh, going, oh my God, that person's a disaster area. That's the worst person to get into a relationship with, particularly for you. And, you, know, you can have friends say that to you, and you're like, no, no, you're not seeing her good points, and she's this, and she's that, and she's lovely, and, you know, if only someone understood her the way I understood her, and all, all your friends are like, oh my God, here we go again. But the thing that makes you pick that person is your issues. That's why you can't see it, because of your own issues. Your your own issues are clouding you. And, and our own, like, a lot of the... Most of the stuff you see in movies, most of the stuff you see in like crime dramas where, you know, he, the crimes of passion, um, strange behavior that people get up to when they're in love, love makes you crazy, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, my, in my experience and in my observation of people, that's not the case. It's, it's, it's uh, their issues, it's people's issues um, that make them crazy. That love is a separate thing to uh, the issues. And um, the best understanding I've got of why people are crazy in, in love, uh, and not in a Beyonce way, like in a, you know, Glenn Close, uh, uh, bunny boiling kind of way, is, um, uh, what's his name? John ba um, Bal Bal John Balby. I think it's Balby. He's a um, psychologist in the 50s, I think. And he uh, spent a lot of time studying animals and the bonding that goes on between animals and their cubs. And um, let's say you're a little bear and you've just been born, uh, very quickly your instinct will kick in and you will have to figure out a way of getting yourself to the safety of your parent. Now most little bears can pick themselves up and bring themselves to their parent. Um, if you're a little fox you'll figure out how to go to safety, you know, whatever the wherever foxes live. I can't remember the name, Set? No, that doesn't sound right. But anyway, uh, wherever foxes live, the little fox will figure out how to get there um, if you're a deer, you'll get to your mother, and so on. Humans um, are more complicated because they can't move themselves when they're born. They're very dependent on their parents. So they have to, as babies, we have to figure out ways of getting our parents to come to us. So uh, it starts off with uh, little, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's highly uh, charged. This isn't like fluffy, um, you know, oh, well, if I can figure out how to get my parents to come to me, that'd be great. But, you know, if I can't, uh, well, you know, it's, I'll get around to it. No, it's like a very primal imperative. We have to figure it out, uh, how, how to do that. Um, so we start off with a bit of crying, probably. That usually works. So I'll cry for a bit and then, yeah, my parent comes over and that's great. But then I cry the next day and it doesn't work. So I have to figure out another mechanism to get my parents to come to me. Mother or father, it doesn't matter. But, uh, you, it's more, usually more to do with the mother, but it doesn't have to be. Well, it's just that it has to satisfy that feeling of safety. So crying uh, worked yesterday, but doesn't work today. So now cooing. When I coo, uh, my father comes or my mother comes. So that's great. So now I've got two. I've got crying and I've got cooing. Brilliant. Um... And then I try crying the next day. Uh, no, they, nobody comes. Okay, well, I'll try cooing. Oh, that doesn't work. Uh, so um, I, that doesn't work either. So I have to figure out some other thing to do, maybe a different pitch of crying or a different type of cooing. And after a while, I develop this, you know, uh, quite a few mechanisms to get my parents to come to me. Um and then I spend a lot of my time then checking all the mechanisms are working, that everything is fine. It'd be like having a fire extinguisher and checking it every day that it was full and, you know, yeah, definitely it all works. It's all good. Great. And they, um, this guy did, um, Balby did these experiments called um, blank face experiments because he figured out that one of the ways that babies check that the mechanisms are working. Now, by, I separated out into days. These mechanisms are established like very quickly, very early on. First couple of days, a lot of them are established. So um, as the baby is, um, when the mother picks up the baby, there's this non-variable communication that goes on between the baby and the mother. The baby makes noises, the mother makes facial expressions and, and noises back to the baby. And the baby knows that the communication channels are working and should there, there be any need um, for um, to you know sound the alarm, and get to safety, everything will be fine. The thing is, um, and this is what I was saying about, this is not an airy, fairy, fluffy thing. Uh, when they he tested this uh, to see how important it was, let's say, to the baby, he uh, la hooked the babies up to ECG machines and heart monitors and temperature, blood pressure, all that kind of stuff. And he, um, he told the mothers, that when the baby, or they pick up the baby, and when the baby makes the kind of cooing noises and, and whatnot, to, to just keep their faces blank and to not uh, join the conversation, as it were. Uh, and they were called blank face experiments. 
So the mothers picked up the baby and the baby started to make the cooing and gesticulating and went through the conversation, the baby side of the conversation. And the mothers didn't do anything. And uh, very quickly, the babies became very distressed, not just in a physical, uh, not just in a crying kind of, you know, emotionally distressed. They became physically distressed. Their blood pressure rose. Their heartbeat went up. Um, their, uh, they, they exhibited all these uh, physical, very physical um, manifestations of intense distress. Pretty horrible experiment, I have to say. Probably had to, <laughs> all those babies would be traumatized. Um, but um, it, it highlights how important it is. Now, fa fast forward a couple of years to the first time the baby is, you know, it's usually around when the, what they call the terrible twos, and the baby starts to get mobile. And for the, the first time the baby gets into trouble. Um, or maybe not. Maybe the parents have got issues going on. I mean, you only have to walk through a shopping mall to look at, to see parents who really... Okay, let's let's be generous. They're having a bad day, let's say. I mean, they look like they're having a bad life, but let's just let's be generous and say they're having a bad day. And they're, you know, I mean, I, gee, I saw somebody the other day um, swearing at their child. You know, sit fucking down and don't fucking, you know, like the kid was like four or something, you know. Um, you sort of pass, you see these things pass them, you know. I'm going to keep the therapy industry going for another generation. Anyway, you see parents like that, and you, you know, you only have to sort of you get a little window into that to know that doesn't that, you know, doesn't have to be, uh, doesn't want to take much for what I'm going to explain to happen, right? So, the dynamic is, as I said, the baby has all these mechanisms lined up. So, if you think of them all like it's like a, you know, in a row, let's say. And then, for some reason, the parent frightens the baby. Now, that could be a harsh word. Let's go for the softest option. Harsh word, harsh tone. It could be an absence, you know, if the parent is distracted. Because there's studies as well with babies. It's a little bit like the blank face thing. But if, the, if, if a baby tries to get a parent's attention and the parent is, like, daydreaming or tripping or worrying or stressing or whatever and the baby can't get the parent's attention, um, that's very disturbing for the child, okay? So that would be the softer end of it. The other end is if the, par if, the child, if the parent smacks the child, frightens the child, makes the child feel say, unsafe, okay? That's, when, that's like getting a boulder and dropping it in all those mechanisms, and they're all smashed on the ground, because from the child's point of view, they've got a deep internal imperative to get to safety um, and they are trying to simultaneously go to the parent and run away from the parent at the same time because the parent is the one that's made them feel unsafe so they're it's very confusing very overwhelming now if you think of all that and then you fast forward to relationships in the present, you know, like adult relationships, if you keep that in mind, it makes it can it makes a lot of sense of crazy behavior. Because generally, what happens is the child will try, and it's got all you know. When the first time and the second time and the third time that the parent frightens the child, all the lovely mechanisms they had, they just cannot get to safety. They just can't figure out how to take all these broken pieces and put them together in some way to get to safety. So everything becomes very confused and conflicted inside the, the child, but it has this very intense imperative of survival, of trying to get to safety. Because if you can't get to safety, then they just never get that release, they never get to settle, they never get to feel safe. Now, if that happens continually and you can never feel safe with your own parents and in your own home, you will just do what you can to survive. And, all, and that's where a lot of the compartmentalization and shutting down and suppression goes on. And, you know, this is a huge subject and I'm just giving you the very potted version of it. But you just make, it, makes, it makes sense of uh, relationships a bit more. Uh, so what you can't deal with, you sort of will suppress and compartmentalize. 
and in a way give up on with your parents, right? But that doesn't mean you it goes away, because um, that whole thing about the Balby and the, the John Balby and his thing, he called that attachment theory, and it's how you attach to your parents or how you get your parents to, to attach to you. And if you have poor attachment, which basically means if your parents frighten the life out of you and you just couldn't get to feel safe, if you've got poor attachment issues. As soon as you fall in love with somebody, it all comes back up. Okay, now that can be like, uh, like in my own case, I can remember falling deeply in love with somebody when I was eleven, right? And I, I know a lot of my attachment issues came charging to the surface, and I was heartbroken when it didn't work out, right? At work out, I don't think it ever even got going. Um, no, it didn't. <laughs> It's not like I had this big mature relationship when I was 11. <laughs> but I was deeply in love. I mean, my wife, uh, Maggie, uh, jokes about me that um, she sort of says, I love hard, you know, uh, like Johnny Cash, I suppose, uh, walked hard. I love hard. Uh, and I always have. But that'd be that's to do with my attachment issues, right? As I see it. Um, so when you're, when I, it's certainly in my, as, as I've kind of looked at my own behavior in relationships in the past that I've had with women um, and my own kind of crazy behavior in hindsight, you know, what, the, what was I, what did I do that for? Why, why did it matter so much? Like I had a huge, I can remember that, imper, you know, that very um, crazy kind of uh, drive uh, that would come into the relationship. And it was always to do with when I'd attached to the person, you know, because I've had, uh, or to the woman, when I've had ex uh, experience of, um, uh, you know, meeting a woman for the first time, I can remember this happening, and I wasn't super attracted to them. And then over a while, I kind of fell in love with them. And uh, and then, of course, you know, they were all I could think about, and I, you know, I went nuts, basically. <laughs> um and that's to do with me attaching uh, to, to them. Uh, because part of what happens is if you can't get resol resolution, you sort of build a little model on the inside of what resolution would look like, what safety would look like. Uh, I kind of liked it in my uh, book, uh, the Maya Noise. Yeah, it's in Maya Noise. I mean, so ha some of this is in Why Do We Get Sick? Why Do We Get Better? And some of it's in uh, Maya Noise more to do with my own story but I kind of likened it as having like you build this I had this mannequin and I, I built this fantastic costume of the ideal woman loving relationship and you know I would try and make this fit on whoever um, I happened to fall in love with or be in love with <clears throat> and of course uh, that doesn't work because you're not really loving the person you're loving who you you think the person is or I heard it put very well um, about falling in love with what you think the person is going to do for you rather than who the person is, you know. So if you think of, if you look at your, you know, it's a useful way of looking at your own situation, your own relationship uh, and your own relationships with uh, loving relationships uh, to see uh, if, you know, your own issues. Because knowing, I mean, knowing my own issues, I've dealt with them to a certain degree, but like I'm happily married now, so they're not, I'm not in that, you know, very difficult place of of the newness of a relationship, because that's where it used to be the hardest for me, because I could never feel, I never sure whether, I was never sure whether it was all set. <clears throat> so I never felt safe. Now that's not saying I feel super safe now, but I feel a lot safer than I used to. But I think I'd be naive to kind of go, oh, that's it. Now I feel safe. And that's something else I've observed in myself, um, uh, but certainly in other people, is is um, how once people get into a relationship, they just sort of forget about a lot of things. I mean, it's human nature. It seems to be human nature for us to take things for granted, that we uh, just, um, whatever it is we have, uh, we just take it for granted. That's fine for most things. I'm not really an advocate of, you know, get up every morning and sort of go, oh, well, you know, uh, I'm so glad I'm healthy because there are loads of people who aren't healthy. Um, I'm so glad I have the money I have because there's so many people who are so much poorer than me. Uh, you know, there's sort of, you know, I'm, I'm not really into that. Um, it's, you know, it's. I understand that I'm, you know, even though I, I'm conscious and I look out and I acknowledge beauty when I see it, not because I sort of have to but I just do it's kind of comes natural to me um 
But I understand that there are things I'm probably taking for granted. Anytime anything changes in my body or if I get a pain or an ache, uh, it's not like I've, you know, oh, I've, if I've got a pain in my knee, I've been go, I've go, oh, well, I don't mind the pain in my knee so much because I totally acknowledge, you know, I was very appreciative of not having a pain in my knee up to this point. So I don't feel like I took it for granted. Of course I took it for granted. I don't think about it at all until I've got a pain somewhere. And then I'm like, oh, God, I wish I could just have not that, have not have that pain. Um, that's fine for most things, I think, but not for relationships. I think one of the, I think taking taking your relationship taking a relationship for granted kills it very fast. Uh, it, might, it might not kill it outwardly, but on the inside, it kills it. Um, and it's it requires being uh, conscious. Yeah, I think it requires being conscious of the way you speak, of the way you um, relate to the to the uh, other person, um, even. Even down to the thing of, um, bet- certainly from as a man with women of, of like um, keeping keeping uh, the mystery of the two of you together, keeping that intact. Um, so you know, not becoming too familiar, I I think is is not a great thing. Um, like um, you know, you see people taking food off each other's plate. I don't think that's great. <laughs> Anytime I see that, I'm kind of like, oh, I don't know about that. I just have a, it doesn't, it just feels like the the separation between one person and the other. Because one of the things that uh, we kind of do, you see it in parents a lot, is we um, blur the lines between me, uh, the parent and the child. So the parent, uh, if they haven't got a good uh, separation between them, you know, in themselves, They'll just view the children as an extension of them. So if the child makes a mistake, it's like the parent made a mistake. So they'll they'll sort of come down on the kid pretty hard because they've let the side down. And that can happen in relationships as well, where um, there was a buzzword for it oh, about 10 years ago, codependency. Yeah, there was a whole industry kind of blossomed up around it. Codependency, where you're sort of so merged together um that the 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 beginning of you and the end of the other person is very blurred together so i think having that kind of mystery uh of between you and a separation between you and uh and like little things of like talking for each other talking over each other um talking about say we do this and we do that meaning you know oh yeah we like that we we like to go to that cinema or we like that restaurant you know there's no there's no new entity that happens i don't think when you get into a relationship you know it's like you morph together and become one new thing i don't think that's good because it is uh, you wear it out too quickly then you wear out the mystery <clears throat> between the two of you so all that's the kind of crazy side of it the uh, issues, attachment issues, which hasn't got a lot to do with love, certainly not in my experience, because it's like that's the kind of surf that you have to get through to get out into the ocean. <laughs> but then when you're in the ocean, that's where the love starts and where you can you can kill the love um, quite uh, easily uh, through your own, you know, need to assert yourself or certainly that's my experience Uh, and like it comes down to you know do i want the love or do i want to be right do i want the you know particularly in an argument where you've been wronged you've been misunderstood uh, and bear in mind that being misunderstood by the person you're in love with and you have a loving relationship with it and is completely different (laughs) from being misunderstood by other people certainly in my experience (laughs) because you know somebody else can misunderstand you and it's like oh you know whatever fuck it who cares that you know it doesn't really matter to me that much but the person if you the person who loves you who you're in a loving relationship with misunderstands you jesus like world war three on the inside that's that's certainly my experience of me it's got so much more heat (laughs) on the inside so much more intensity um like oh you boil on the inside how it's not and it's and that's to do with the issues to do with attachment issues because you're basically you've tripped a safety wire on the inside and you feel like the 
I don't feel like it's it has the intensity of I'm going to die if I don't sort this out. Now of course you're not gonna die if you don't sort this out. But it can feel like that on the inside. Um not consciously, but the intensity, that's where the intensity comes from. At least that's my experience of it. A lot of difficulties uh, can arise and arguments and grudges and resentments um, can come from hanging on to stuff and and you know you it, I wouldn't consciously kind of think because in the heat of the um, argument or the difficulty or whatever it is you find you feel wronged or there's something up and you're not happy with your partner and you're you want to complain to them about it or you want to do something about it or you want them to be different um, you're not thinking about you it's hard to kind of go do I want the love or do I want to be right about this issue you know and like often you read about stuff and where what happens in relationships particularly longer term relationships it's the little things that drive each other nuts when you're living together you know they're the leaving the toothpaste off the they're leaving the lid off the toothpaste or you know farting in bed or whatever it is this is you know there'll be things that your partner does that drives you insane or they could drive you insane if you <laughs> let them but you know divorce rates are very high so it's 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 this is a thing like for people it's a big thing um but for me it's kind of like um when my wife does stuff that annoys me or there's things, you know, that, that my wife does that I think, oh, well, now I think, uh, you know, she should stop doing that now. I think that's terrible. I think she should absolutely or start doing this thing or stop doing that. So the other thing, like, I, it's good to listen to what you have to say on the inside. But I always come back to or I was, yeah, so far I always can come back to, do I want the love or do I want to be right? Do I want the love or do I want to be right? And I... I want the love, you know, doesn't matter that much to me, really. Um, the toothpaste, the lid and the toothpaste thing, well, that thing does, that doesn't actually bother me. But if it did bother me, I, I kind of go, well, do, you know, do I want to live on my own <laughs> with the toothpaste, the lid always on the toothpaste? Or do I want the love? Do I want the, because uh, those little things are only like, will be a small percentage of the greater love that you share with the person uh so uh to me it's like oh well I, I don't really care about it that much yeah it's annoying but i don't care about it that much uh, i don't care about it enough to uh want to give up uh the love now that's that's not to say that uh, it's not good to keep looking because people change you change and your partner changes and sometimes what was great so isn't great anymore and to kind of go, no, 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 we're married or we're, we're in love and it'll always be, we're, that's it. You know, I mean, I do think the commitment of marriage and when you say you're committed to the person, whether you're married or not, if you say I'm committed to you, that that's important, that it's, that it's too easy to kind of cause build up a kind of stash of resentment and like, oh, I'm not happy, this person isn't the one, um, that I shouldn't be with this person. It's too easy to build uh, that up. Uh, if you haven't got some sort of commitment to yourself that I am going to stick with this person. But having said all that, it's it's not good to just go asleep. And it's not good to, to, to not look um, and have this ongoing conversation about with yourself about whether, um, you know, this is a real thing or you're being mistreated or you're, the, you know, the other person's issues are... Um, having a go at you or you're being abused you shouldn't no one should be abused no one should stay in, in an abusive relationship at all and abuse can be very mild so it's uh, complicated it's paradoxical there's a lot uh, to it but i have found anyway coming back to this thing of do i want the love and do, or do i not helps me um weed out a lot of bullshit petty stuff that Really, when I come down to it, isn't that important to me. But I could, could allow to grow into this, you know, growing ball of resentment if I didn't weed the garden of love <laughs> on the inside um, uh, to make sure that that didn't happen. Because uh, what I've found, um, and I heard this from Barry Long years ago, and it's it's true, if you're going to leave your partner... 
you don't have to worry about it uh, because you only know for definite that you're leaving them when you're putting the suitcases in the car. <laughs> now that sounds very simplistic but in my experience it's true. Um, I spent, um, whenever there was a breakup coming uh, in the past, I would spend a long, long time going over it in my mind, going, oh, should I stay, should I go, should I stay, should I go? But in the end, I didn't think about it. It was just very clear, I just did it. And that was, it was just done. And n knowing that now uh, is very helpful because um, I don't get into the thinking about it. Because I know that, I mean, as I say, I'm very happily married, but if... Uh, if uh, the, there was a breakup imminent, it would just happen. I would just do it. I would just put the suitcases in the car, and it wouldn't, you know, there wouldn't be that sort of thought process involved uh, in it. Because, and that's, I've had the experience of doing that and knowing that. And I've had both sides of it, thinking my brains out, and um, worrying myself sick, thinking about it, angsting about it. Should I stay? Should I go? And in the end, always, it's just you're putting your suitcases in the car or whatever that, that is. It just happens. You just do it. Your body, in a way, just does it. Um, so knowing that means it cuts out an awful lot of thinking and angsting and wondering if this person is the one. I don't think there's any the one, by the way. I think that's, I don't know, was that invented by Hallmark? <clears throat> the whole idea of the one. Hallmark and Hollywood. The one. Your soulmate. Mm, I don't know. Really? Soulmate? There's tom so many people, you know, there's like, so, like I haven't met them all, but there's like, I've met a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people, you know, you just got to a stadium, there's so many people, like there's only one person for you, one soulmate? No, that sounds very issuey to me, it sounds very attachment issues, like, um, and it sounds like there's, a, you know, a shopping list, the shopping list that we have, which is, you know, another version of that mannequin, the, you know, the, the costume of perfection that you want to put on some unsuspecting person <laughs> and try and beat them into it <laughs> um yeah i'm not so sure about soulmate i think it it can i don't know it can drive you nuts thinking about um you know you start to get into comparisons and and use it as a reason for um not being happy in a relationship because you're not sure if you're with the, the one or not the good thing is that through focusing on the love and saying, do I want that or do I want the love? And kind of go, no, I want the love. I have found that the love uh, has grown with myself and my wife uh, in, very, in a very sweet and kind of innocent way. And I think that's the flip side of what I was saying at the beginning about not uh, looking at other, you know, relationships, this kind of blanket term of relationships and what's how is it supposed to work between men and women you know 10 tips for men and 10 tips for women and all that like fuck all that really because the i think you know if you're happy together and you're sweet together then that's what counts like and what what is right for the two of you or what's you know right for you initially um but you know assuming you're, you know what might be right for you might be right for your partner um but assuming you know that, that you're, it's right for your partner as well, and they're happy as well, I think I think you have to go, come back to your own, rely on your own rules and your own sense of it, and what's how you feel for yourself, um, to get rid of a lot of stuff, because we can have ideas about what a relationship should look like and what should be um, how a relationship should be. Sex, for example, is a big thing in relationships and it's a big bone of contention um, sex and money I think are the two things that, that couples argue about the most um, and a lot of the issues around that uh, particularly sex because money is more it's uh, more outside it's more to do with prestige and status and your you know your you as a couple your relationship to the outside world but sex is to do with you the two of you and generally, um, you know, one person will have a, a higher um, sex drive than the other. Now, sex drive could just be code for, you know, a lot of attachment issues and I need a lot of soothing. Uh, you know, in a man's case, I need a lot of soothing through my penis. <laughs> but, um, you know, generally the problem will be one person will have a higher libido than the other person. If you're looking outside yourself and you're the one who's dissatisfied with your sex life and you don't think you're having enough sex, 
uh, it could be disastrous. So you could end up breaking up about it uh, if you're looking outside your relationship. Because according to what's going on outside, we're all, you know, should be having sex, uh, you know, three or four times a day in exotic and interesting locations uh, using props, uh, costumes and, uh, you know, a good soundtrack. <clears throat> Which isn't the case at all. Um, and the hilarious thing about sex is... Uh, sex is uh, particularly, and I'm only talking uh, like uh, from my perspective here and as a man, but uh, often a lot of the sexual stuff is to, is very far away, you know, like you see on movies uh, or in porn or whatever it is, you know, you're never, like sex is very close up, you know, you can't see all that stuff, well, everything is close up, you know, if I'm holding my hand up to my face, well, all I can see is my hand, I can't see, you know, my, any gyrating going on or kinky underwear or mood lighting or anything like that because the person's face has obscured it, you know, so there's a whole part of sex where there's this, there's a psychic, um, I talked in other, another podcast about the psychic world, but basically there's a lot of uh, psychic entities who are just having a lend of people. That's why the, I think the porn industry is as big as it is. <clears throat> and, you know, if you, you just Google the statistics on porn, uh, it's hilarious because it's like huge on the internet. It's the biggest thing on the internet is porn. And yet, like, we're all talking about Facebook. <laughs> Facebook and PayPal and eBay. And it's tiny compared to the porn industry. But anyway, uh, I think a lot of, uh, I think if you're particularly, I think it's men mostly is, you know, women do look at porn as well, but it's mostly a male, a male thing. Uh, but so if you're a man and you're, you know, you're, you know, you're looking at porn, be aware that like there's probably about 50 psychic entities having a look as well with you uh, because that's all they can do is look, you know, because I think if it, if, if it was a, a thing of, and uh, if it wasn't, there wasn't a psychic element involved in it, there wouldn't be a porn industry because it'd be all, everyone would be having sex. They wouldn't be looking at people having sex. You know what I mean? It's the looking thing. That's all a psychic entity can do is look. So it may as well look through your eyes uh, at, 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 through a lens at some other thing because they're getting their jollies out of looking at that, you know. Um, but anyway, going back to, you know, your dissatisfaction. If you If you gauge, you could be like very happy, very loving, very sweet... But if you sort of feel like, well, society is telling me I should be having a lot more sex than I am, then uh, you're going to be very unhappy um, and you're, you'd not be tuning into in the same way as, uh, you know, a doctor could tell you that you're per in perfect health. And if you don't feel right on the inside, um, it doesn't matter what you're being told from the outside. If you trust your feeling on the inside. Also, uh, conversely, if you know, you're being told, oh, well, you should get this vaccine or this medicine or you should be on this as a preventative, blah, blah, blah. But inside you feel like good and you're in tune with your body and you've spent time getting in tune with your body. I don't mean like you're just separated from it. You're genuinely in tune with it. Um, then you kind of go, no, you know what? I'm just going to go with my own feeling here. The same thing with your relationship. Uh, if you go with your own feeling, with your relationship, you, like you stand back from it as far as you can. You go, is this loving? Is this sweet? Am I going, you know, are we going deeper into the mystery of love? Because, like, the, the, the thing is, uh, like, relationships are high profile, very high profile in human interest. You only have to look at all the, the stuff on telly, cinema songs, poems, we are into each other, right? Human beings are into each other, big time. And I think that's because it's important. Because if you meditate very deeply, um, you're sort of withdrawing from existence and you're going into the mystery. Highly recommended, very worthwhile. But I don't think you are in having this experience. I don't think I am having this experience to be not having this experience, if you know what I mean. What I mean by that is I'm not um, in existence to be out of existence because when you meditate, that's what you're doing. You're withdrawing out of existence. And it, like my observation of human beings and myself as well is we want to communicate. We want to have interactions with each other because I, and I, I'm fairly confident of the, why that is, is because that's where... And um, that's one of the reasons we're, why we're in existence is to communicate with each other. It's almost like a way, it's, it's like the internet in a way. Existence is a way where we communicate with each other and we work things out. 
And there's reality in the communication. Deep reality. And the uh, it's not like we're just kind of wandering through being friends with everybody. We have this thing of, of like forming a deep uh, communication with one person and going right into that. And I think what we're going right into is love or you could say God or whatever because that's another very helpful thing in relationship is like you can think about God as a a state uh, but God's kind of impersonal it's very hard to kind of you can kind of have a sense of God you can know God but you, it's very hard to have a conversation with God but you can have a conversation with the person you love and you could say that that is God coming through somebody um, I don't know whether that's true or not but I, my sense of it is um, that, you know, in as much as I am part of, you know, a little part of God, so is the the person that I'm in relationship with, and so is everybody, all the people that I meet. Uh, now, some people are more clouded over than others, and, you know, I, it's not like I would have a relationship, like a deep, deep relationship with everybody, but s certainly uh, with one person, we have this uh, descent, procession, descent into... Um, deeper and deeper awareness of something. Hard to name, but let's call it love. We we'll call it God. Um, and I, I suspect that's why we're so into love, why we're so into relationships. So my top tip for relationships is there's no such thing as relationships. Um, there's just your relationship with your partner, if you have a partner. Um, Yes, that's my top tip. My top 10 tips um, are broken up, are joined together into that one t tip, um, 10 tip. <laughs> okay, yeah. until the next time. Yeah.